Dr. Antonenko, members and guests, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here to come speak at the Southwestern Surgical Congress. It's my first trip to this meeting, and it's <coughs> exciting. It really is a great meeting. I hope I get to come back. I might not get to after this uh, talk. Um, first of all, my disclosures, this is sponsored by the American College of Surgeons, so I think I should disclose right from the beginning that uh, they have a, a new policy, but I want to tell you that I do have a number of firearms, pistols, rifles, and shotguns, uh, but I'd like to, as part of my disclaimer, say I've never actually shot anyone. <clears throat> we are having venison Saturday night for our, our, I think our, our Easter dinner. Uh, one part about this is uh, I'm also the uh, uh, last speaker of about uh, eight from the college, so vir virtually everything I've said has been said already, and so we'll, uh, uh, maybe I can present it a different way. I spoke a couple of weeks ago in Oklahoma. They, uh, those folks generally know where Texas is, but I didn't know if everybody did. It's a larger state, uh, kind of a little south uh, east of here. I'm from Crockett. The uh, spring of 1836 was a big year in Texas. Uh, a lot of settlers has come down the El Camino Real. It's a, it's a, a trail that led from about Vicksburg area uh, down through to, to uh, uh, Mexico City, and it came right through the town that I live in, the town that I grew up in in Crockett. Uh, and, uh, uh, one of those settlers that came through from Tennessee was named Davy Crockett. Well, after the fall of the Alamo and then in April of uh, 1836, uh, when um, Sam Houston took uh, Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto, there was a struggle to grab these names and uh, put them in the names of cities, things like Milam and uh, Travis, uh, Bonham, names that were f famous in Texas history. Well, we grabbed Davy Crockett. He, he was friends with the folks that lived in Crockett, and he stayed there for a while. If the Trinity River had stayed up, may maybe he wouldn't have made the Alamo. But uh, uh, it went down, and so we renamed our town Crockett, and we named our county Houston. It's the oldest county in the state after Sam Houston. Well, that kind of got the people in Houston a little bit upset, and so they changed their town from Harrisburg to, to Houston. So hence Crockett's actually in Houston County, which isn't really that close to Houston. It's a town of 7,500. It's rural, it's old, and that means poor in Texas. The average income in my town is uh, 24000 for a family of four. Um, I'm going to present a couple of things today. I'm going to present the first part of my talk. It's going to be uh, a variation of Dr. Stickus' talk about uh, what rural surgeons do. I I'm going to disagree a little bit. I think rural surgeons are really just general surgeons. They're general surgeons that, that have a broad uh, practice. Uh, I'm going to go through um, some statistics of the American Board of Surgery. I'm chair of the recertification exam committee. We're the group that brings that little quiz you get to take every 10 years. This is the November stats from the November-December uh, quiz. It went on for two weeks. There were about 1,800 people uh, that uh, took the quiz, uh, and we also used the RUCA maps, uh, as Dr. Sticker did, to uh, stratify urban and rural. There's, as you see, these numbers don't total 1,800 because there was uh, a large number of people that uh, could identify their zip code correctly or maybe in the military, uh, and so we don't have those stratified. But basically, we've got uh, almost 1,400 urban um, surgeons that we know were urban and around 216 that were rural. And we also excluded some that were in the middle that we didn't think we should count. So um, th there's a big difference in numbers. As you can see, the, the rural surgeons did, did about 630 uh, cases. Now I'll tell you, all these are, are, are averages. These aren't statistical numbers. These are just the truth. Uh, the urban surgeons did around 461 total cases. That's going to come down almost all to endoscopy, as you'll see, as Dr. Sticker pointed out. So I'm going to stratify these out into several groups. Uh, in GI cases, uh, the rural surgeons cover a few more uh, people as far as population. So you're going to see a few numbers for common procedures. That's colon appendectomy. Colon cystectomy be a little bit higher for the rural guys, but pretty similar for colon cases. Uh, biliary, you see a few more for the uh, rural guys. And pancreas, there's virtually no cases happening by either one. And I guess this is reflective of what's happening. I think there is regionalization of pancreatic surgery. I probably have seen my last uh, Whipple, although I may slip in there and get a distal pancreatectomy again before I die. <clears throat> the vascular case, this is an exciting number. Now, the vascular guys would say, uh, I would say, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, these are still substantial numbers. The average surgeon is doing more than one <coughs> vascular case, both in urban and rural areas. So I would say that we still need to train general surgeons to be able to sew blood vessels together. It's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. It, it's, it's almost as easy as putting one of those balloons and blowing up a vessel that they've got off on doing these days. But I, I think we need to keep vascular surgery as part of general surgery, whether you're urban or rural, it, 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 in, at some level. 
you could say these are access cases. I, I don't care what, what kind of cases there are, but I think there needs to be an understanding of vascular pathophysiology within that needs to stay in joint surgery. These are some other cases. Uh, thoracic cases are still being done in a fair number. I mean, I, I have friends that are general general surgeons down in Houston, a, a mecca of thoracic surgeons that still do a fair number of thoracotomies. <clears throat> less done in rural areas, they probably have less support. These gynecology numbers were a little bit surprised to me. I, I do a fair amount of gynecology. I probably do at least a hysterectomy every month and some other cases, that would, oophorectomies, DNCs that would count. But there's pretty small numbers there. Uh, obviously, the urban guys aren't doing it. Those are probably almost incidental cases. And the rural guys, at least on an average, are not, not doing that many. Ortho, as you can see, we're doing very few. I'm not sure what, what those numbers stratify to, but I expect a lot of those are amputations. Although, the, the, I, I think the rural guys, a, a fair number of us still uh, put a few tendons together. Here's the big number. Endoscopy. The rural guys are averaging 216, the urban guys uh, 44. Um, it's a split, colonoscopy and EGDs. Uh, I think the American Board of Surgery, I think uh, rural surgery, and I think the college uh, it, it feels that endoscopy is part of surgery. We are doctors that take care of the GI tract, and you cannot take care of it without being an endoscopist. Hernias, um, as you see, the numbers are pretty similar. It's interesting that rural guys are doing laparoscopic hernias as, as well as uh, at the same rate as, as urban. I would have thought maybe the urban guys have to uh, justify those fancy things, but it's, it's pretty e even uh, numbers. Appendectomies, a few more by the rural guys, uh, just because they're uh, covering uh, more patients, but uh, these are similar numbers, whether you're urban or rural. Colostectomy, again, a few more uh, laparoscopic cases. Uh, by the uh, rural guys, but cer certainly uh, the stratification between laparoscopic and open cases has taken over rural surgery just as well as it has in the cities. GI cases, I just pointed out a few statistics here. Um, the enterolysis, which was the uh, a fundamental case when we all trained a few years ago, is getting less and less common. I think these are small numbers. I think most of us think that when we were resident, it, it seemed like there was a bowel obstruction on the, on the uh, docket every day but it's become a less common procedure. Colectomies, uh, the rural guys are doing some uh, laparoscopic ones as well. And then GI bypass, this really reflects this rural number of 0 0.1 is that there's no obese people in rural America. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually not. I guess think, I think rural docs are just smart enough not to operate on them. <laughs> so the uh, second part of this, this talk is gonna be uh, more in line with what I do on the American Board of Surgery. About a year ago, Tom Cogbell, I think many of you know him, uh, uh, he and, and many others have a real interest in rural surgery, and he put forth this General Surgery Advisory Committee for the American Board. Uh, the board has always had advisory committees in transplant and pediatrics and vascular, et cetera, trauma, but never had a General Surgery Advisory Committee, and so this is an exciting time for the board. It recognizes general surgery is, is a, an integral part of uh, American practice, and it comes at a critical time. This, um, this committee is, um, is a pretty forthright committee. Uh, everybody would say the board has no right to say what happens in medical school, that's the AAMC, or it doesn't have the right to say what happens in, um, in uh, residency training, that's the uh, ACGME and the RCs. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, all these things. But what the board does have and is in control of is we strongly feel that we need to, to ascertain the quality of American medicine, particularly surgery. And, and, and we think that gives us the power to, to, to look at what's happening in American surgical training and to do whatever we can to make it better. And this really comes out of a fact that, and I, I don't want to say that American surgical training is bad. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we're unhappy with the product that's being finished right now. We're unhappy with what's happening uh, at a, a testing level. Uh, our certifying, that's the oral exam fail rates, have been going up steadily for about five or six, seven years. They may be leveled off now with our new exam. Uh, and our, our subjective feedback of the new people going in practice, most new people in practice feel they're qualified. Most older surgeons viewing these young people in practice feel that they don't seem to be able to operate independently. Uh, I, I don't want to belie beleaguer this topic but the American board feels that we need to do everything we can to produce a better co product. Uh, I think that means that this committee, GINSAC, is gonna look at things that happen pre-residency, uh, and we may need to be looking further down the line. We know that most medical students 
know they're going to go into surgery before they even start their surgical rotation. We may need to be starting in the earlier years of medical student to get the best and the brightest kids to be surgeons. We may need to go to college and pick those guys out and, 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 and direct their careers towards surgery to improve the product. Specifically, we're, we're going to talk about what Dr. Sachdeva talked about, this um, boot camp idea, as, as we're calling it, this, this preppy program through the board. Uh, we're looking at things in the residency I'm going to go through, and then we're talking about this six-year thing. Whatever it takes to produce the best surgeon in America is what we're going to do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about med school, this prep, what we're calling preppy. We just changed the name, this pre-residency preparatory instruction from boot camp, because everybody thought boot camp sounded like it was going to be tough or something. It's uh, a, a uh, it's right now, the board has voted to endorse a, uh, a boot camp type course in medical school. Uh, that means recommend and endorse. We, we are not at the edge or point of requiring it. But what we are trying to do is to add strength to this course that Dr. Sachdeva talked about that's put, put forth by the, uh, the ACS, the APDS, and the, and the ASC. Uh, this boot camp has been developed primarily at Michigan but it's going to uh, come online, as he pointed out. And what we did was we outlined some course objectives that, that if, you t if you use the college course, then you will have obtained those. This was also our, our voting and recommendation was to give strength to the AAMC, specifically Tim Flynn's efforts at bringing out these boot camps, not just for surgeons, but for internists and non-hospital base that would have different curriculums, but basically to get more out of this fourth year in medical school. We, we think we're not getting the, the same medical student we got 20 years ago as far as procedures and what they can do. And so therefore, uh, the board is going to endorse this concept, although we're not going to be the purveyor of it. I'm, I'm going to review the course as the board sees what should be in it real quickly uh, in, the, in the light of time. So I'm going to flip through these pretty quick. <laughs> this thing flip through real quick. Uh, <laughs> These are the didactic components, lectures on everything from surgical uh, history to how to run an EMR, disorders and coagulopathy, how to choose a surgical practice. Uh, so these are the didactic components of the, of the boot camp. D demonstration of surgical skills, uh, just how to tie knots, etc. cetera. This, this needs to, our, our starting residents need to be able to tie a knot, um, placement of sutures, handling of instruments. Uh, all of these skills, both these uh, open and the laparoscopic, are based upon skills testing. In other words, you just don't go show it one day. Uh, and you've got to achieve certain levels that are timed and the ability to do these. Uh, laparoscopic skills, introduction of trocars, tissue dissection, uh, placement of clips, et cetera, things that uh, we, we want to have a new um, intern to at least have a, a base knowledge of before they start. And these are the exciting parts for me. I, I, I think that every medical student should have put a Foley catheter in, probably and failed at doing it, and everyone should be able to put an IV in and draw blood. I, I think these are assumptions that we all think our interns can do, but I think a lot of interns, uh, their first day, have not even done an intubation on a real patient. So these are things that, that need to have been reviewed before you start your internship. Other procedures, placing an NG tube. There's no excuse for a medical student that hasn't done that. So then let's look at, if, if, we, if we get a better medical student product, what can the board do to make a better residency? Um, Score, as we mentioned before, I think that's exciting. Uh, I've been on the board, I guess, seven years. Uh, and it's, so scores kind of came out during my time on the board. Uh, it's amazing to me that over 100 years after how steady in education and surgery, we're just now getting to a comprehensive curriculum, that is score. And I think it's really exciting that, it, that no matter where you are as a resident, you basically have the same curriculum. Um, the Ashley rule, it's 12 months of electives in the last 24 months. This kind of goes back to this thought about um, uh, do we want three years of general surgery, three years of specialization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of breaking into that by allowing the, the residents to have 12 months of electives their last two years, whereas before, as you may know, that particularly the fifth year was proscribed to just be general surgery. We're going to do, uh, try to institute PGY-1 and PGY-2 required cases. This has been a little bit controversial. What we're trying to do is to push down the, the operating a little bit in the residencies. Some programs aren't designed that way. Some of them, the intern never sees an operating room. But right now, we've put forth a recommendation that, that you do 75 cases in your internship. We're trying to get 200 cases done by the PGY2 year, and we're really getting a lot of kickback on that. But the idea is to get the interns doing something earlier, so hopefully um, they'll have more experience by the time they're fifth year. These required teaching cases, maybe 25 cases that you teach, a pretty uh, low bar. 
And then the Milestones Project, where residents are observed every six months or so, and we look and see if they're on track at the level for before to, to, get, to get their training completed. And then this is the this six-year thing that we're really arguing about. And boy, th this, is a, uh, this is a real interesting topic. Uh, there's many of you all that want to fix the five-year plan. I'm all for it. There's many of you all that think that we need to make general surgical residencies this fellowship. I think there are some components that, that uh, have been talked about this six year, these trial programs that are going to be coming out in the next year or two. Uh, I think the board's going to look at those really critically and, and see do they produce a better product. I think there are some th thoughts about these, um, these, uh, that six year that are, that are critical. It, it's got to not be ACGME, it's got to be where they can bill. So they can bill, they can operate independently because that's what we're missing. We're missing independent operation, and if you read the uh, article by Tom Naska that's come from the ACGME this, the, a couple of months ago, uh, they point out clearly that while operative numbers are the same after reduction of work hours, and that knowledge is the same, although we might could question that, um, that what is different is it appears that surgical management of disease is not as good after work hours have been introduced. And so just the comprehensive management of the patient is what our, our completing residents are, are lacking, and that's what we need to address as one of our issues. So whether it's going to have to be in a six-year, I, I can't tell you. The, the board will do whatever it takes to try to produce the best product. Uh, we want to keep more surgeons in general surgery. I'd like to see these programs, these six-year programs, grant a master's degree. Uh, so you could put, you know, MD, uh, MS, FACS. You wouldn't have to have 16 letters like LD. But you could have a few more letters after your name. I think that, that docs like that. They, they'd like to have, would love to have a master's degree plaque up on the wall. Uh, maybe they could be called master surgeons. I'm not going to argue about the name of it. But I think there probably is some role for some of these pr uh, projects. I think that, that certainly not every finishing resident feels comfortable. And we don't want them to run off and go do MIS or breast uh, or acute care just because they don't feel comfortable, and we'd like them to be able to stay in a general surgery program. So uh, that's what I wanted to bring you. I, I'd be happy to answer your questions about board activities. Uh, I, we're interested in feedback, what you, got, uh, what you guys think about what we're trying to do to make a better uh, a product, uh, and uh, thank you for allowing me to come.